We continue our reading with our New Testament passage, Mark 4, 35 through 41, if you can put it up there. Um, I'll read off this translation. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was all already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind. And he said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. And he said to them, why, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the reading of God's word. May God add his blessing to it today. Shall we pray? Father God, we thank you again for this time, this moment, as it was never promised, and yet you gave. God, may it not be wasted. Lord, may these words be yours. May our ears be attentive, and may the storms be calmed. And it's in your Son's most holy and precious name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so there was these two boys, James. Michael. Now they were your typical neighborhood best friends. Summer hit and it's it's game time. All right. They were riding their bikes together. They were playing baseball. They were playing basketball. Typical two boys who are best friends. But they had that competitive nature about them. Everything was a competition. So you can imagine friendly game turned into a nice debate, turned into a little bit of a fight, then it kind of turned into getting mad and walking off, going home. Then they would get back together the next day, kind of repeat the same process. But don't, don't get me wrong, they were best friends. But one day, Michael, he had some exciting news. He couldn't wait to go tell James. He had got a new toy. His family had gotten a new toy. So he grabs his toy, and he runs over to meet James, and his face drops as he realizes that James was coming towards him with the same toy in his hand. Now, what was that? What was that toy in their hands? Well, it started with a leash, and it ended with a dog. So... First, Michael approaches and looks at, at uh, James and he says, look, this is my new dog, Speedy. I call him Speedy because he is the fastest dog in the whole wide world. Michael kind of looks discouraged and confused and he said, hold on, hold on. Your dog cannot be named Speedy because my, day, my dog's name is Speedy and he is the fastest dog in the whole wide world and universe. And so they debated for a little bit. They had a little bit of a conflict and they realized this must be solved. There must be a dog race. And so they make the conditions and they say, we will meet here in one week. Prep your dog and get ready. All right. So first you have James and he took this very seriously. So he, he, every day he would run with his dog. He'd take it through sprints. He made sure its meals were, were, were well portioned and that he drank plenty of water. By the end of the week, James is speedy. Man, it was one physically fit dog. I know it's incredible it happened in a week, but it happened. However, Michael had a slightly different approach. He got home, he sat down, and he started thinking. And he said, what about my neighborhood? How can I really get ahead of James? And he realized one important fact about his dog. And that was the fact that he was a dog. And his neighborhood was filled with squirrels and mailmen and all your typical distractions that you would have. So 
with the running, with the physical training, he also did something very unique. He made his speedy resistant to distractions. How did he do this? He would simply take his dog into his quiet room and he would just tell him about his day. He would tell him about his frustrations, his angers, his happy moments, his emotions. And Speedy began to recognize his voice. Race day finally comes. The two boys meet up. They're in the middle of the street and they're just like, game on, all right? And so they start, you know, prepping their dogs. They're pumping them up. They're saying, let's go. Here's a dog treat. Let's do this. And so, first, James sets his dog up. He says, game time. Starts walking off. Realizes that Michael was doing something very strange. He was blindfolding his dog. And he's just like, Michael really wants to make this easy for me. I got this in the bag. You can see the difference between the two dogs. My dog is more physically fit. And so they both go down, go down to the finish line. They do the whole count off, three, two, one, and they start calling like crazy for their dogs to come. Both are coming, and Michael Speedy starts getting ahead. Then it's James's, and James is really picking up speed, and you can tell that James's dog is about to win when suddenly a friendly squirrel decides to run across the road. So, James's dog takes off after the squirrel, while Michael continues to call his dog towards him until Michael's dog finally crosses the finish line. The race was over. Michael was the winner. And they walked home as best friends to do another day of competition later on. This is a pretty neat story, right? And I'm sure in some way we can all relate to it on some level. We are all competitive at times. I mean, we all strive to do our best. Is that sort of correct? Especially in this culture, with our jobs, with with our teams, if we're on sports teams, we, we want to strive for that ultimate goal, to be the best. But the question is, in our endeavors, how is our prepping time used? Let me give you a glimpse into my daily routine. I wake up to the sound of my alarm, drag myself to the shower. I'm a morning shower person. I, can't, I just can't wake up well without a, a shower in the morning. Turn on some music to help me wake, wake me up more. After I'm ready, head to work. Usually turn up the radio a little bit. And I'm, I'm that guy, all right? I'm that guy who turns up the radio and I'm just like, you know, I'm going crazy and people are driving by like, who is that? That's your youth minister, that's me. Finally get to the office, walk into my office, grab my Bible, try and get at least 20 minutes of reading um, while I play, you know, some, some calm instrumental music in the background. As the session's going on, I notice my mind usually, usually wanders a little bit, you know, to and fro between the tasks of the day, but, you know, I, I get right back into my reading. Then when that's, when that's finished, I proceed with my daily tasks, whatever, whatever my tasks are of that day, talking to people throughout the day, going running errands, doing whatever, but, you know, again, I'm a huge music fan. I usually have some music playing during that time, and eventually, at the end of the work day, go home to my newly beautiful wife, and we usually eat, watch, watch an episode or two of one of our favorite shows off Netflix, and then head to bed, only to repeat a similar process the next day. But... In thinking and prepping to talk today about this topic, I realized that my daily routine was missing one very important element, and that is this. Do you hear it? It's 
silence. I can almost guess that in times of silence, it's, it's almost awkward. Um, it's almost awkward maybe at that moment when we went into silence for most of us. But the question I want to pose today is this. Should silence be so awkward? Or should it be embraced as a vehicle in which we encounter God himself? Now, friends, I'm not speaking about quietness. Quietness is similar to what happened a second ago. You have some background noise. Most importantly, this was probably the loudest room in the world. When silence occurs, our minds start racing. Suddenly thoughts go in. What is he doing? What? Why is this happening? What is going on? What is my task? What do I have to do? And silence suddenly turns into the loudest time that we can encounter. Yet, deafening silence. Has anybody heard deafening silence before? The silence when you're out in the middle of an open field, out in the country, and it's like the loudest sound you can ever imagine because it's so quiet. Deafening silence. It's phenomenal. Yet, in this culture especially, that we live in, we are often too much of a go people rather than a stop people. And even when we do try and stop, the nature of go is constantly yelling in our ears. Again, to go back to how I prepped for this talk today, how I prep every day with my daily routine, I have to tell you, I was getting a little bit upset. I couldn't hear God as I normally hear him. We had work camp this past week. And so as you can imagine, it was was crazy. And it's still crazy. And, you know, I haven't had much of a break since. Hopefully it comes tomorrow. But but I couldn't hear God throughout my preparation. I was praying hard, very hard, asking, what do I need to do in order to hear from you, God? What direction do you need this to go? And though God was speaking to me, the storm of my thoughts clouded the, mind, clouded the voice that was trying to speak to me. I was essentially creating my own storm, and I was trying to seek God in it. Have you all ever heard of this problem before? Has anyone, anyone ever had this problem before? Maybe every day? Well, what about our friend Elijah? the one who we just read about, maybe he can speak a little bit more towards this. Again, this is 1 Kings 19. This is 9 through 11. Sorry, 13. It says, And behold, the the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am am left alone. They seek my life to take it away. And he said, go out, stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by a great and strong wind tore the mountain, broke it into pieces, the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of sheer silence. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? This passage is really intriguing to me. Because you have such a man of God, someone who we look at through the, through the scriptures, the one who just defeated the prophets of Baal. And suddenly he's running scared for his life. 
In this first place, this first passage, this first section here, it says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he gives excuses, almost like a convict who is running away. Well, I've done this, and Israel's doing this bad, so I just, I just ran, you know? And God's like, I see what's going on here. Okay. Step outside real quick. And these storms start occurring. But God is not in any of it. Now, think of a reader back in these days, all right? Time before Job, Exodus, Deuteronomy, there are many occasions of God showing up in such a loud way. So, it was very odd in reading it in this context to see that God is not showing up in these flashy and big ways. Instead, he shows up in sheer silence. That's not a typical God. That's our God, though. The great and powerful. And so after this, after he makes his example, he again asks, Elijah, what are you doing here? So God, God shows up in maybe not the ways in which we expect it. We realize in this passage that the real storm didn't lie in the elements that were outside of Elijah. The real storm was inside of Elijah's own thoughts. The ones he had created, the fear he had conjured up, to the point where he could not hear God anymore. These storms, these storms that we create of the same nature are harsh on our senses. Harsh on our senses to hear our true God when He speaks to us. And the same goes with Mark 4, 35-41. Right? Disciples in a boat with Christ going across the sea the epitome of chaos. And the sea starts going crazy. Demonic in nature. These disciples, they're like, you're just going to let us die? Is that what you're wanting us to do? And Jesus is like, hold on. And he doesn't rebuke the disciples, but he rebukes the sea. He says, be still, peace. Because Jesus in that moment realizes that the storm outside of the boat was not the problem. It was the storm inside of the boat. That was the true problem. And he asked them, you have little faith. Do you still not understand? They still could not see who Christ was due to the storms that they were creating on their own. So how does this apply? How does this apply to us? Let's look back at a story about James and Michael. True to that, true on the outside, it seems like the story was about these two boys, these two competitive boys. But if you look at the story in a deeper way and on a deeper level, the story was about the dogs. In the end, it was the dogs' competition. It boils down to the training of the dogs as well. Both underwent this extreme training, but the one who knew the voice of his master and knew how to find it without his primary senses, the sense of sight, was the one who succeeded. Maybe we should resemble something similar. Maybe we shouldn't go with our gut all the time and thinking that God's going to speak to us in big and flashy ways. But seek God in the silence that occurs. Make it not so awkward and embrace it. So the question remains, are we training to listen to the voice of God that speaks to us in the deafening silence? Or are we trained to create fantasy storms that hinder us from hearing God when he's speaking to us? How is it? that we calm these storms in our life? 
maybe, just maybe, is through the practice of external and internal silence. So may we embrace the silence and find God within this week in it. And in seeking out that, may it be our mission externally and internally to calm our storms. Amen.